Have a seat. Welcome this summer day. Uh, it is nice out. Isn't, isn't it amazing how just nice it's been this summer? It hasn't been too hot. It's been a little rainy. Um, but would, would you bring me that table? They, they ditched the table on me. But, but as we get started, thank you. Get paid double today, Spencer. Appreciate it. Yep. <laughs> As we, uh, as we get started today on this summer day, we know that I already walked, looked that the, the online attendance has gone up, and we know that, you know, butts in the seat goes down a little bit in church, but praise God, people actually still come to church in the summer at New Life, and we can come here and we worship, we can come here and learn, and then for that reason, we, we plan for the f- future just what the summer looks like, and there's Vacation Bible School that's going to be coming up in a month from now. Um, there's different life groups that are meeting. There's different summer activities that are taking place. Membership class is coming up. I want to make sure I plug that. I don't know. I can't remember exactly what's been plugged, but I want to make sure next week during the second service. So if you want to be a member at New Life, um, we really want you to walk in that process. It's, it's just this idea of, you know, this is what we're about. This is what you're about. And membership is not for people who are just kind of questioning Christianity. It's for people that are saved, the people that love Jesus that are partnering with the church and the mission of the church, which is to make more disciples. And so if this is what you're about and you know that New Life is your home, then we want to encourage you. I don't want this to be something that takes away from your decision, but Pastor Chuck will be leading it. And so just <laughs> No, we've partnered with this for a long time. And then one of the things that you're going to be doing through this process of membership in New Life is going to be sharing your testimony and how Christ saved you. And so I would encourage you to, to walk through that process. Next week is your on-ramp for the starting point of that. And so uh, all that being said, we, I have been said like two weeks ago, we've been walking through this idea of wisdom, the application of knowledge. And two weeks ago, I said, I think this is the end, but I knew that there's going to be this gap between now and 1 Corinthians that I'm unveiling for you today that we're going to be starting here in a short period of time. And then each week, Mike and I have been doing something different. He preaches downtown. And he's been doing stuff, I think, on a Sermon on the Mount this, this, this week. But um, I decided to kind of keep going extra credit. This idea of outside of Proverbs, what are some case studies of wisdom? And so we did that last week through the book of James. And we looked at taming the tongue and, and what that means. And basically, a 25% of all Proverbs is based on our speech. And so we talked about that. And so I thought that this week, since we didn't cover it yet in the series... I would do a, a, just a case study on wisdom through people who are probably the most applicable people in all the Old Testament, in my opinion, as to decisions that they are making for the wrong and what we can learn from them. Because something that I said early on in this series is an 80s campaign through wearing seatbelts that you can learn a lot, do you remember how it went, from a dummy. And uh, there's this guy in the Old Testament that in some ways we want to emulate, in some ways we want to stay far from. And his name is Samson. To plead my own ignorance and how lacking of detail I can be in my my life, I wrote his name down about 20 times on some notes this week. And then I went back and read the text again. And I was spelling this man's name wrong. It's not Samson, it's Samson. Like Samsonite, right? So it's S-A-M. And I had to go back and, and spell check because we have someone that plays spell check for me on the team, all of those times that I wrote Samson. But just so you know, it's not Samson, it's Samson. And he is a guy in some ways that we want to be like, in some ways we want to stay far from his legacy. Samson is known as one of the strongest men who's ever lived. And his story is kind of how really good stories start. He grew up in a time that was everyone did what was right in their own eyes and he took it to the next level. Uh, but he kind of has this fairy tale esque story at the beginning that some other people in the Bible had. Uh, once upon a time, there was a, a man and a woman who couldn't have any kids, and an angel showed up and said, you are going to have a boy. Does that sound familiar? Uh, people by the likes of John the Baptist's parents, uh, Abraham and Sarah. And so from the time that this child was born, he was going to be special to God. And the way that we know he was going to be special was not just that this is the narrative, but it was also this idea That before he was ever born, there was this Nazarite vow placed over his life, which was very unusual because this was typically a vow that people chose for themselves. But this vow before God was chosen for this character named Samson. 
And so as the story unfolds, there were things that he could not do because of the vow that was placed over his life. He was set apart to do work for the Lord. He couldn't eat grapes or anything made from them. He could have no wine. He couldn't touch anything dead. And he could not, how does the story unfold? He could not do what? He could not cut his hair. Why? Because God said so. And so then we learn that the source of his strength was in his hair. And I don't, there's nothing magical to my knowledge about the hair itself. It was just this was the vow that was before God. And so when God gives you a vow and when you make a promise to him, sometimes there are special rules that apply because he set you apart. Okay, even when you take, and I didn't plan on going here, but I will for just a second. Even when you take something that maybe isn't for everyone, like, like wine, it's not a sin to have a little wine. We know Jesus turned water into wine, but for him, if he would have done something that God told him not to, it would have been a sin. And so really, if you look at this from a deeper theological construct, this is really a microcosm of Israel itself. There were similarities between God's vow and God's call on God's people as a whole, as a nation of Israel, that really represented Samson in a sense, where it's a microcosm of the entire story. God chose Israel to do something great. God chose Samson to do something great. God chose Israel to stand out. God chose Samson to stand out. And so Samson has this superhuman strength. And just like Israel gets off track, Samson in his pride and his arrogance gets off track big times. Uh, big time. He, he had this Achilles heel. And this is why it's one of my top five stories in the Bible. It is an Achilles heel that's running rampant. And it's been running rampant ever since uh, the bite of the apple. Samson's problem was the ladies. He could not keep his eye off of, not his wife, but any lady who met a certain criteria through a very superficial lens. And so he has the brawn, he has the strength, and he also has the downfall. He has his first job, if you remember your first job, and we covered the topic of work a few weeks ago, and his first job is border control, border patrol. And so you see his weaknesses starting to manifest in his young life as he's guarding the border between Israel and Philistine. And when you look at the narrative of the Old Testament, there are certain people like the Canaanites who keep coming up. And the Philistines are one of those people where they are people who hated God's people. They were people who were not kind of bad, but they were evil. They did terribly evil things. And so one of the questions we have when we look at the Old Testament is how could God, right? Have you ever asked that question? Well, how could the God of the Old Testament operate in this way? You have to understand the larger narrative of the Old Testament. There were people that were demonic, that were God's enemies. So, for example, the, the Philistines did things in their worship to their pagan gods that were atrocious, just like the Canaanites. They would sacrifice small children, and this was not something that was kind of outside of the bell curve of normality in their culture. This was happening frequently. And so these were the people that were against God's people. There was a border. They were trying to take the land. And back and forth, the narrative goes. You get to the story of David and Goliath. Who was David? Or David, he was one of God's people. He was the runt of the litter, and he was a king. But who was the person that he was fighting against? Goliath, this nine and a half foot tall giant, he was a Philistine. And so this is later in the narrative, but you see these things go on and on and on and on. But Samson's first job was border guard, border patrol. The problem was that both spiritually and physically, he could not stay on his side of the border. So before we ever get to the text, I want to read you the prequel of this narrative. The Bible says in chapter 14 of Judges, and we're going to be in chapter 16, so I'll just read this quickly. Samson went down to Timnah and one of the daughters, and saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. This is kind of when we know that there's a larger narrative to his life that's unhealthy. Verse 2, then he came up and told his father and mother, and this is his mindset, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. And this is his kind of Charlie and the Chocolate spoiled brat mentality that he walked in. I want the world. I want the whole world. He says this, now get her for me as my wife. Well, why is this wrong? It's wrong on a couple levels. But a major reason it's wrong is just the spiritual reality of what's taking place, let alone the fact that these people did horrible things. God set his people apart, not just culturally. This wasn't a racism issue, but he set his people apart spiritually, just like he does now. The Bible says that we are to be equally yoked with the people that we date, the people that we marry. And he is going after a young woman who is not someone who worships the one true God of Israel. 
And he says, even though he knows this, with this Nazarite vow, this call on his life, he says in this next verse, now get her for me as my wife. And mom and dad play a passive role in the process, and they say, but his father and his mother said to him, is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all the people that you must go and take a wife from this uncircumcised Philistines? Now here's what they should have said. Don't use rationalization. When the Bible creates a a black and white issue, don't make it gray. They should have just said, no, we're not going to go get for you a wife where you know God has not called you to operate in this way. You are flirting with this border spiritually where you're not just going to another side to find another person, but you're going to another side to defy God intentionally, and we're not going to have anything to do with the process. It's not going to be, well, Samson, is there anyone else? It doesn't matter if there's anyone else. It's not going to be this situation. But they play kind of this lukewarm role role in his life. And Samson says to his father, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. Now think about it through this lens. The last part of the narrative of this entire book of Judges is that everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And in Hebrew, this is really just kind of peeking its head early because it's the same type of language. And so he's playing the role of dad and spiritual leader in his home. And he's saying, get her for me. He's spoiled. He's a chip off the old block to mom and dad. And for whatever reason, they don't want to fully stand up to him and do what's right. They plea with him, but they don't stand up against him. So then the story starts progressing where the rules don't apply. Everyone doing what's right in their own eyes. He gets married to this woman. They have a wedding at her church on her side of the border. So he's really going into the enemy's camp, literally. And there's a setup that pursues... He ends up humiliating the Philistines, so they kick him out and keep his wife and marry her off to someone else. And at the end of the story, she pays the price, which is tragic, and she's burned alive for her association with him. And you would think to yourself, well, this young man who's full of testosterone and strength but lacking wisdom is going to finally learn his lesson, but the story progresses, and it's not till he has his eyes gouged out that at the very end he figures it out. Because then the next piece of the puzzle, right before we get for our text today, is that he does the same thing again with a prostitute. He slips across the border. He sleeps with a prostitute. The Philistines find out that he's there. They hate him. They surround the whole city. Samson flexes on them and takes them out. And now as we get to chapter 16, the narrative starts slowing down and gets more focused on one particular woman. And her name is Delilah. Hey there, Delilah. I mean, it's not... That's not the same person, but you track him. And then you read this story. How how many of you, first of all, have read this story? Just know of it. You grew up in Sunday school. You you know this story, right? What do you know about this story? It does not go well. But when you read this story or you hear of this story, how many of you thought to yourself, specifically as she continually sets them up through the text, how could this guy be so stupid? Anybody? Anybody? And then you live a little and you go, oh, that's how, right? These are the things that actually happen in life. And it's so obvious to everyone around him, but for whatever reason, he cannot put the pieces together. And I think there are very good reasons why, and there's the same reasons that you haven't put the pieces together. There's the same reason we live by the definition of insanity when it comes to lacking wisdom and the relationships that will ultimately uh, ultimately be a reality for us in our lives. And so here's verse four. We're gonna all read it in the text together. Here it is. It says this. After this, this is right after the prostitute. He loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came to her and said to her, seduce him. Another translation would be lure him. Any fishermen or fisherwomen in the crowd? The lure is enticing Lure him, seduce him, and see where his great strength lies, because the Philistines were tired of getting their butts kicked. He was mocking them. He was a problem. He was a thorn in their flesh. Past his life, the story goes on and on and on with the same type of of narrative. They, They could not stand God's people. And so see where his power and great strength lies. And by what means, here's the strategy, we may overpower him, that we may bind him to humble him. And we will each give you 1,100 pieces of silver. How much money is that? I tried to translate that. I did a little study this week on this topic. 
Some people would say that's somewhere around 90 grand. I don't know if that's accurate or not. I think that's hard to actually determine, but that's what I found. And so in today's economy, let's just say, let's round it up. It's, it's 100 grand. It's a, it's a really nice sports car or a really bad house in Aberdeen now because the housing market is out of control, right? Uh, so verses 6 through 7, so Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies and how you might be bound that one could subdue you. And here's where it's like, what are you doing? Oh, sure, good idea. It sounds like she really loves me for me, right? If you don't see the setup there, he's not thinking clearly. Verse 7, Samson said to her, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, that have not been dried, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. And so at this point in the story, she sets him up. Things start progressing. He's tied up with these bowstrings. Obviously, it doesn't work. Verses 8 through 9, Then the Lord of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried, and she bound with them. And now she had men lying in ambush in the inner chamber. And she said to him, the Philistines are upon you. The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he snapped the bowstrings as a thread of flax snaps when it touches the fire. So they just explode. And the secret of his strength was not known. So she's toying with him. She's manipulating him. He's manipulating her. In his arrogance, he thinks that nothing can take him down. And she sets him up with these bowstrings. He snaps them. And at that point in the story, I'm just going to keep running with this idea. How could he have moved forward with her? Well, he's like so many of us. Verse 10, then Delilah said to Samson, behold, you have mocked me and told me lies. You're going to see an escalation of manipulation in their relationship. And this has already been happening, but now it's escalating. Please tell me how you might be bound. Master manipulator, you made a fool of me. At this point, he should be saying, why are you trying to set me up? What are you trying to do? I I'm, I'm, want to spend the rest of my life with you, or at least I want to spend the rest of my lust with you. And you can't even have character to not tie me up and try to send me to the Philistines. And his response instead is, well, it's not bowstrings. You have to have new rope. And she gets new rope. And then just so you know, here's a little caveat. She gets him drunk. Never goes well. And says, the Philistines are coming. He snaps the rope and she cries. Why do you keep lying to, you, to me? Can you just see her crying on the outside? And she's probably just laughing on the inside. The story progresses further. He says, well, you have to tie my hair up, and if you tie my hair up, then I will lose my strength. And then she realizes this doesn't work, and then here is kind of the climax of the manipulation in verse 15. In verse 15, the Bible says this, and she said to him, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? Now, everyone look at me for a second. At this point, if you have any wisdom in your life, you should have just had a gag reflex, how in the world could he be this stupid? You have mocked me three times, and you've not told me where your great strength lies. And when she pressed him hard with her words day after day and urged him, the Bible says his soul was vexed to death. And we go off the, the ESV at New Life. We feel like, as a leadership team, it's the most accurate translation coming from King James. And I know people dispute about that, and we're not going to have that discussion today or probably ever, but that's what we do. Uh, but there are things that we learn from other translations. The Bible says in the NIV that she was nagging and consistently prodding him. Day after day after day after day, she's making it about her when she's also trying to at the same time capture him and kill him. And so when her body did not work as a seductive tool, she just used her mind, and she just broke him down over time. And the Bible says that he's vexed, verse 17. And at this point, Samson, who thought that he could play games with God, play games with her, play games with the Philistines, kind of walk this dance of the border, finally breaks down, and he tells her the secret. This is how I'm so strong. And he told her all his heart. We don't know exactly what that entails, but we know that that's not good. He, he breaks down to someone that he shouldn't be vulnerable with. And he says to her, a razor has never come upon my head, for I've been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. So the truth is finally revealed. And it's just kind of this Shakespearean 
drama that's playing out where then she says to him again, as she, can you imagine just her mindset as she's rocking him fast asleep and shaving his head? And she knows because she's deceptive. She knows that he's finally told her the truth. But she's going to test the theory. And as she's testing the theory, the Bible says that as his head is shaved, the Spirit of God left him. And she says, you know, she says to him, the Philistines are coming, the Philistines are coming. And in verse 21, he loses his strength. We get the climax of the storyline in the negative. And the Bible says, And the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. And he, uh, he ground at the mill in prison. Think about this. This hey there Delilah script in his life. He's with someone that he sees from a border. He's with a prostitute, never learns his lesson. He's now with the worst character out of all of them. The first one's somewhat innocent. She's just from another land. And can you imagine in his mind's eyes or in his lustful eyes when he first sees Delilah and he likes everything about her in the physical but not in the spiritual? When he thinks that he's in control and he's telling his parents what to do and ultimately he's telling God what to do as this man who's been set apart but not walking the walk and living the faith. That as he sees her for the first time, he has this endorphin release that he chases that takes him to a pit of despair. But as he's chasing the endorphin release, think about this in your mind's eye. The first thing that he sees is Delilah. But I would imagine that the last thing he also sees is the same person through a different lens. He now sees in his last image before his eyes are gouged out the same woman who now has set him up And what I want to do is just walk through as we truly, genuinely, there will not be another wisdom sermon. And maybe that's good for you. Maybe you're like, uh, that's about time. Or maybe that's something that saddens you. But this is truly the end. This is the, the extra credit, extra credit. What I want to do is I want to just talk to singles, young and old. And for those of us who are married or been there, done that, been through some trauma, I want to glean some wisdom from someone as a case study who lacked wisdom. What I want to do first is I want to break down Samson, and then we're going to break down Delilah. What can we learn from this man? The first principle is this. Lessons from Samson, you're going to see it on the screen. The first lesson is this, that God's boundaries are a gift and not a punishment in your life. That God's boundaries in your life are not to punish you. It's not that he's being the fun police, that he's protecting you, and he loves you too much to let you do the things that will ultimately destroy you. Because the last thing that this man sees is the very thing that got him into the predicament over and over and over again. The principle of this text, amongst many, is that right or wrong is not based on what we want to be true. Because the entire narrative of this Old Testament book, before we see kings rise to the occasion, is that everyone, the reason they needed judges is because everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. And so in a culture in 2024 that is based primarily on your truth versus my truth, which has actually become more fundamental than that, that that ways that are wicked are the ways that are right in 2024, and, and ways that are godly are the things that are repulsive to the culture around us, but still in this idea of humanism and relatively relativity that you can't just do what's right in your own eyes, that there's an objectivity that stands over you that will ultimately destroy you. And so the first wife, Samson, says, get her for me, that's what I want. Mom and dad waffle, are you sure you want to do that? When they should have said no. And by the time he gets to Delilah, he is so narcissistic that he's operating in this thing called delusion. By the time he gets to Delilah, he's lost all sense of reality and he overvalues his own strength. He forgets that although he has strength, that he has a source to his strength that can be taken like that. And so test after test, finally he tells her the truth. I don't know if he was drunk. I don't know if he wasn't thinking clearly. Or I don't know if he finally believed the lie that he was actually the source of his strength and that his hair didn't matter, but he quickly found out who God was. And the last thing he sees is this woman who's just betrayed him and gotten the best of him. But God's boundaries are a gift and not a punishment. Like I said when we started this text, that there was a God that the Philistines worshipped. His name was Dagon. And he was actually a God of food. 
And they would appease the gods in the Old Testament to these false gods and false religions by giving them things to make them happy. And I tell you this all the time in church, but in case you're new, that false religion, which is every religion besides Christianity, is this idea of earning your way to God to appeasing him. Christianity is you can't do that. You're sinners. God is perfect. His love for you is also perfect. He sends his son Jesus to the cross in your place. Love comes down. You don't work your way up. You don't have to give him the right sacrifice. You sacrifice because of what he already did for you. And the Philistine people were sacrificing all sorts of things, but one of their key sacrifices was child, uh, child sacrifice. So they would kill their own children to appease their false gods. And so God's saying, I, I don't want you to have anything to do with that. Don't, don't look at this through the lens of culture or maybe through an, uh, a modern age of, you know, uh, just ethnicity. Look at through the lens of the spiritual implications that still exist today, that the reason God has a boundary of you marrying a born-again believer if you're in Christ is because truly you have nothing in common, number one, with anyone who doesn't love Jesus because that should be your highest priority and then also, you are going to pay the price of everything that they bring to the table, and it might not be in the temporary when you're looking through an endorphin release, but it's going to be through the longevity of your life of this person not having the same value system as you. And so he's protecting his child, Samson. How many of you can relate to this reality? That God loves you now that you, anyone in kind of like the middle age and now moving past? That when you look back through the lens, you can see that God loves you too much to give you what you thought you wanted. This is wisdom that you can pour out to the generation right behind you. Thank God in my life as someone who's quickly balding and becoming more pear-shaped by the minute. Thank God in my life God did not always give me what I wanted because it would have been a train wreck. God gives you what you need but he protects you from what you think you want. And so there was a cultural division, but ultimately there was a spiritual division. The question then becomes this, why did Samson end up with Delilah? And the answer that I wrote down for you is that you're gonna see on the screen, and I want you to write this down as well. If you're single and you're not writing this down, that's on you. Here's something that someone told me 10 years ago in ministry, a pastor on staff said, water always finds its own level. Why did Samson find Delilah? Like, strike one, shame on you. Strike two, or that's not how the saying goes, right? But, but fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, fool me three times. Water always tends to find its own level. If you're going from situation to situation to situation in your life that's foolish, that is causing a lot of emotional and spiritual pain in your life, at some point you have to look in the mirror and say, the definition of insanity is the means to which I am operating it. That when it comes to, and that doesn't mean that the person who's done bad things to you is the same person that you are in every way, because maybe you would never do the things they do, but you have to look in the mirror and go, well, water's finding its own level because maybe they've been someone who's been a perpetrator in my life, but I've consistently been the enabler. Or maybe in my own insecurities or my lack of spiritual depth, I choose to find someone that has these issues because I don't feel worthy to have someone that's healthier that loves Jesus. I mean, I'm not going to play armchair psychologist in your life because I don't know every story in this room, but there's always this reality that when you jump from bad situation to bad situation relationally, you have to come to terms with this reality that ultimately water finds its own level. And so the ultimate problem with Samson is not Delilah. She's symptomatic of a larger spiritual condition. He wants something unhealthy. Now, I don't think he's the type of guy that's going to be that manipulative like she is, but she wants money. And in his life, he wants, I mean, there's kids in the room, but are you filling in the gaps? They both want something that's ungodly. And what they ultimately want is not the other person, but they want their own temporary endorphin release. And in that sense, water is finding its own level because two selfish people are coming together. Here, here's what it looks like when it goes right. There's a lady in the Bible who is noble, who is godly. And she actually comes from a faraway land, and she ends up coming to, to faith through her mother-in-law who brings her to Israel. And that woman's name is Ruth. Ruth is this Proverbs 31 prototype. And because Ruth is doing things and living in a way that's godly and putting her own needs second, what happens to her? She finds this guy, and his name starts with a B. His name is 
Boaz. I think someone in our church actually named their dog Boaz. I think it was the Creeper. I can't remember. And we went through that story a long time ago in church. They actually named their dog Boaz. Boaz is this prototype of someone who takes care of, who has his ducks in a row, who puts God's first and lives with high moral character. And so this is what happens. The reason I bring it up is they're, they're just this arbitrary example, right? This is a story in the Bible. But this is how it actually plays out when water finds its own level. If you are now in a certain stage of life where you've been there, done that, but you keep doing the things that you used to do, you have to look at this reality of you have to answer the question, why? Why do I keep doing the exact same things? Well, the reason you keep finding the person that you don't want to think you want to find is because you're not the person that God's called you to be. And so you're not going to find a Boaz and you're not going to find a Ruth if you don't deal with this reality like Samson never did. We had a couple in our church who helped not start the church, but right after the church started, they got involved, and then they ended up moving to Sioux Falls for a job. And uh, there's a couple named Amber and, and Toby Bryant, and their daughter was at a softball tournament for, at Northern this weekend, and we were watching. And one of the people that we really loved in their family was Amber's parents. She had these very godly parents, still does. Her dad's gone to be with Jesus. And her mom lost him to cancer about nine, ten years ago. And we always ask, it's like one of those families where you just catch up and it's like nothing's changed. And I say, well, how's your mom doing now? And she loves talking about her mom. And she said, you're not going to believe it, but a year ago my mom found this guy who's in his mid-70s. She's in her mid-70s now. She thought she'd never get married again. Um, but, you know, they go to, I think, Central Baptist and in Sioux Falls, and they, they met through a friend of a friend, and they got married not too long ago, and he's a great guy, and he lost his wife, you know, and then there's the rest of the story, and the reason that I bring that story up is it's just this perfect example of, of course she found a great guy because that's who she is, and she had this criteria where she wasn't going to go after Samson, and he wasn't going to go after Delilah, because in this sense, water found its own level, and they're now single into their golden years. But how do you then find that? I'm going to try to go through these ideas systematically. How, how do you actually find someone that's at a different water level that you're trying to aspire to? How does water not find its own level, or how does water find its own level in a positive light? Well, here, here's what people do that walk in wisdom that Samson and Delilah, through this case study, never figured out. They focus on the process, write that down, not the person. And so if you are single in this room, and maybe you're young, or maybe you're older, and maybe you know, you've learned through some trauma in your life, and you don't want to push repeat, then something that you need to really focus on is the process and not the person, because we always look to the person to either save us in our false idol worship, the person to rescue us that ultimately is destructive in our lives, when really... The way that we find the right person, Jordan Peterson, I know he's like a Catholic now, but I, just, just a quick quote that he tells young men. He says, if you want to find the princess, just become the prince and the princess will find you. That if you focus on the process and you don't go chasing the border wall and you don't go sleeping with the prostitutes and you actually become the person of character that God's called you to, that Samson could have been in his life because he had everything at his fingertips, when you focus on the process and not the person, now things can change and the person will find you. There's a guy that's gotten really popular on reels and he had a lot of controversial statements. I'm gonna quote one of them. I rarely quote him specifically in church, but take it for what it's worth. I saw it on a reel. His name is Mark Driscoll. And he said this. He said, when it comes to finding a spouse, young men tend to look at this one matrix. She is hot. And then he says, because he's like the Trump of evangelicalism, he says, so is hell. <laughs> and I want to add to that statement because single women's process is give me attention. I want attention when it's not godly and water finds its own level and the process is flawed. I want attention. And I would just tell you this as a pastor, Satan will also give you attention. Just because they give you attention doesn't mean they're the person God has for you. So do you have a process that will allow the right person? Here's another takeaway from Samson as a single man. Selfishness. If you've been married like 30 years, 40 years, who are you? 
50 years. Anyone? You know this is true, right? So help me just validate this. I'm at 20-something. You, you've got more experience than me. Selfishness marks every unhealthy relationship. True? <clears throat> In fact, I've heard this said. Behind every sin is this overarching reality of selfishness. So when you look at these two lives as a case study of lacking wisdom, what ultimately marked both of their life was sin, but more specifically the character attribute of selfishness. What is it the root of every sin is selfishness. What is it the root of every nasty relationship fail is selfishness. And so if you're looking for a good future, specifically young women, and I know it's summertime and I should have had this message like in March, but here we are. Send it to your grandkid. When you are looking at every unhealthy relationship that you could potentially enter into, you will always find selfishness. But here's the question of water finding its own level. You are attracted to what you will ultimately find, and you're attracted to that thing because you're not where you need to be. Are you attracted to the person that you say you think you need? Because Samson wasn't attracted to the right. He could have had any woman he wanted in his land. He was a judge. He was a... He was a major player in the Old Testament. He could have had a very godly woman, but he wasn't attracted to that thing that he knew that he was supposed to obtain because his heart wasn't right and he was selfish. And so when you're looking for a good future, are you attracted to a selfless young man? Are you attracted to the person who is showing you evidence in their life of godly character, that they are making the next right decision, that they are going to, in a sense, take care of you and be a nest builder with you, Are are they someone who has a vision for their future with you? Uh, Do they have a vision for their family? Does he put your needs now first? Because everyone who's been married a while knows this. They're showing you the best version of you that you're probably ever going to get. Amen? Right Right now, they're, they're like on the dating game. They're telling you all the right things. You get 10, 15 years in with these character deficits, you are seeing the best version of them now outside of a radical conversion in Christ. Here's the last one for Samson. We'll move to Delilah. When you don't take God's vow seriously, someone always gets hurt. And so it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of of, of how and what. When you don't take God's vow seriously, someone always gets hurt. And so this idea that I can do what I want, you will figure it out on your own, but you're gonna figure it out through pain that you never intended to go through that really is so avoidable, specifically when you're young. So quickly, let's cover Delilah, then we'll close. There's our no-brainers. These are softballs. I wrote them down. It's like a youth sermon today. This is where my mind's at, right? Number one, Delilah's beauty is skin deep. And so something sad about Delilah, amongst many things, is that in a practical sense, when her stalk is the highest, her character is the lowest. And so her beauty is skin deep. I I was thinking of this analogy, and maybe it's even a little offensive. I don't know, but I think it's something that we can all walk in. Has anyone ever seen the Christmas Vacation National Lampoons? Very godly movie, Chevy Chase, (laughs) right? (laughs) Lots of good family dynamics. Anyone love that movie? I can tell a lot about whether or not you're funny if you like that movie or not. That movie's funny, right? You remember that story when they're all at the Christmas table, and there's this beautiful turkey, I'm not saying women are turkeys, but this is where I'm going. And you remember Clark, how excited he is because finally he's putting the pieces together. Finally, after all the dysfunction, now they're going to have this Christmas meal. What happens when he cuts that turkey open? It looks so perfect and glazed, and he's giving thanks and credit where credit is due. He's thanking his wife, and it's finally come together. And then he cuts that turkey over. To me, that's like beauty that's skin deep. It's like, oh, look at how magnificent. And then the relationship progresses, and the beauty is skin deep, and the Proverbs 31 is lacking and vice versa. I mean, these are both ways with the the men and the women. And and then there's this reality where the the climactic point of the storyline is the turkey is cut open, and everyone is disappointed. That's what beauty looks like that has no character attached to it. And the reality of of marrying someone like that or being with someone like that where the beauty is truly only skin deep is it doesn't matter how attractive they are, 
they're going to, at a certain point with that selfish tendency that runs through their vein, be repulsive. So Delilah has this beauty that's luring and seducing, but there's no substance to it. Here's another reality of Delilah. Manipulation is a destructive way to get your needs met. The nagging and the prodding and the manipulating and the gaslighting is exhausting. He's exhausted to the point, and and he's no angel, he's exhausted to the point where he just finally just caves. And he tells her this thing that ultimately is his demise. And so manipulation is a destructive way to get your needs met in a relationship. Here's another reality, Delilah. You can get what you think you want and lose what you actually need. Let, let's just say it's 100 grand. How quickly, first of all, we don't know what happened to this woman. Did, did she die with the rest of them when he, when he pushes the pillars? We don't know exactly. But let's say she lived to be 80 years old herself. How long with this type of mentality do you think that 100K lasts her? How many of you suspect, based on the characters she displays, that she didn't put that in some type of conservative 401k plan? That she probably went to Beverly Hills, spent it on some stuff, took it to the casino. How long before you think that she finally realized that what she actually needed wasn't what she has been wanting? That when you live with this type of selfishness and impulsivity, And this is what guides the character and nature of your life because you want nothing to do with the true risen Savior, Jesus, and you walk in this type of selfishness that even those things that you want in the temporary are fast bleeding because you don't even have the maturity to handle them. And so she thinks she wants this temporary satisfaction. And there's different people that break this story down. They say, well, she didn't really have as much choice as a woman in the Old Testament that you might think she had. I'll give you that. So maybe we're being too hard on her because she didn't have a lot of options. But at the same time, the way that she's lying and the way that she's manipulating tells you that she is not above reproach. But at a certain point, it finally dawns on her. And when it finally dawns on her, because I promise if she didn't die young and she lived to be older, it does dawn on her that she doesn't have her ducks in a row. And the last thought I have on Delilah is this, that Delilah sets herself up perfectly to live with future regrets and bitterness as a result. And so when her stock is the highest, in an earthly sense, her character most likely is the lowest, and just like all of us, she'll figure it out if she doesn't die young, but she'll figure it out in a way where she's living with past regrets. Now here's the good news of the gospel. Can she be redeemed? 100 million percent, absolutely. Can he? Well, just read the end of the story. He has one final hurrah. But the story is tragic because the story specifically for Samson is so incredibly avoidable. This isn't a guy that was pushed into a corner to make, you know, bad decisions in life. He was someone who was set apart by God. And so we'll close with this idea that you walk into this place, and I don't know everyone's story, but we're going to assume that you're here in church this morning because Jesus has set you apart through the lens of the gospel, that he has saved you, that you're not perfect Because only Jesus is perfect, but his blood has purchased you. You took communion this morning. You know Jesus, but you're not living in wisdom in this area of relationships. And so you are setting yourself up perfectly to live with future regrets and bitterness that are completely and absolutely avoidable if you would change trajectory now. How does that specifically look? Well, Jesus tells us to the Apostle Paul these two major areas of heart transformation that then manifest in the marriage covenant into your future. If you want to see this transition, then look towards the future and walk backwards from the future that God has called you to and make decisions in the now that will affect the later. Because Paul says in Ephesians 5 that that women are to, to respect their husbands, but it starts with this idea that before they ever submit, that that men are supposed to love their wives as Christ loves the church. And so there are these things that happen when you love Jesus that you're going to put someone else's needs first because Jesus puts his church needs first. That you aren't going to be selfish because your Savior isn't selfish. If you want to get this right, then truly surrender the process to Jesus, love like him, and become the person that he's called you to be as a means of finding the person that God's called you to. 
Delilah sets herself up, assuming she lives to a ripe old age, to live with bitterness and resentment. And I just want to say one more time in closing, it's so incredibly avoidable. That before God ever gives you a vision for your future with someone else, he first gives you a vision for your salvation in his son Jesus. And that's the domino that is the domino, the first domino that lets everything else fall. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. As we truly close this series out, help us to be a, a people that are redemptive, a people that look to you, that we're all sinners, that we've all messed up. But help us in this time of wisdom or even lacking of wisdom to have this moment of reflection of all the things that we've learned in the last several weeks. And specifically with this issue of finding our future spouse, that we would look to you and we'd say, Jesus, make us like you so that when the water finds its own level, we find someone who loves you as much as we do. Jesus, we thank you for dying in our place. We thank you for forgiving us of our sins. And we just pray, God, that you would work on our hearts in this area of our lives. We pray this in your name. Everybody said, amen. Let's stand up.